Front rows uh, off. Oh, welcome to session one of 2023. The general topics room. Tyler Warren of Eden Valley Watkins Kimball. You wonder where the blank that is. It's uh, south of St. Cloud a little bit. Uh, more appropriately, south of Holdingford. Um, I don't know what's written on Tyler's bio. I'm just going to do my own bio because uh, Tyler coaches in the conference that I used to be in. So I keep track and pay attention. Uh, he hasn't been around that long, but it was all of a sudden, what the heck's happening at Eden Valley Watkins Kimball? They're really doing well. And through a whole bunch of uh, events, wasn't just this or that. Uh, going to three classes, they are in <laughs> They're likely one of the smallest classes in AA, both for uh, true team and um, high school league, but you would never know it because of how well they're doing in AA. They were fourth in the AA true team state meet last year. Although you're single A in high school. Double A and true team, single A in high school okay. Very confusing. Well, what, what made that occur to me is that uh, I clerked at the 5A meet last year, and something to be said about the coaches also is that their kids are just so freaking nice. It, it, it was just so enjoyable to be clerking and uh, interacting with the Eden Valley uh, people. So he's going to talk for about an hour, and we're live. So don't stray too far so the camera can get you. Gotcha. Okay. Um, as Mark mentioned, I have not been coaching for a long time. This will be my eighth season starting this spring, five seasons as a head coach. I uh, started out as a junior high assistant coach and learned a lot from my fellow coaching staff um, and just kind of dived in that way. Hopefully you walk away with some takeaways. Um, that's my goal here. Uh, before we get started, as Mark mentioned, I'm fairly new to the sport. I've presented zero times here. I have zero sports psychology degrees. Um, part of the things we're going to talk about today are just some little mindset things that you can do with your athletes. Um, I don't know about the athletes in your program, but we kind of deal with the high flyers type perfectionist athletes. And so a lot of times um, they'll struggle with kind of the ebbs and flows of the season uh, as far as the ups and downs and running into obstacles and making mistakes. Uh, so just going to focus a little bit on that. So to give you just a little roadmap here, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about our program. It's a little bit unique that we're two schools combined in one. We travel every day. There's lots of logistics involved. I'll talk a little bit about what we do, kind of the year-round investment before the season starts. Um, but I'm going to spend a majority of the time kind of talking about our purpose of what uh, we do throughout our season for our athletes to kind of get them pumped and ready for the end of the season here. So just a little bit of an overview, as Mark mentioned. Our school districts are just a little bit south of St. Cloud, about 30 minutes. Uh, Eden Valley Watkins graduates about 50 to 80 students, depending on the year. Kimball's a little smaller, somewhere around 40 or 60. Uh, we have seven coaches on staff, and then we travel every day. Uh, Eden Valley Watkins does not have their own track and field complex. Kimball does. Uh, so before the weather gets super nice at the beginning of the season March, the Kimball athletes and coaches bus over to Eden Valley every day. When it gets nice enough and we're able to be on the track complex every day, the Eden Valley Watkins students take a bus um, over to Kimball every day and practice. So it's a lot of logistics working with two ADs and coaches at you know, both schools and making sure the athletes are um, knowing where they're supposed to go. The other thing too, we didn't have a track until 2017, a meet compliant track I should say. Uh, when I showed up, I was very naive. I grew up just south of Eden Valley Watkins. I knew they didn't have a track. I thought Kimball had a legit track, but they just had a tar track. Um, so we used to roll out mats on the tar track for our hurdles. Um, we couldn't host any meets, and then we had a little uh, little tornado come through Kimball. So we got a track now. 
Uh, so setting the stage here a little bit, uh, some of the things that I think our coaching staff does a nice job of is we make an effort and we support our athletes year-round um, in other things. Uh, two of our coaches went to uh, the Eden Valley Watkins versus Kimball girls basketball game, which is my least uh, favorite sporting event to attend throughout the year. Um, part of our unique situation, our schools are big rivals in other sports, so it's a little unique when we come together in the spring. Um, but it's really cool to see those kids make connections and friendships and they kind of put that rivalry aside there. But we just make an effort to attend games. I go to Kimball volleyball games. I go to Eden Valley Watkins volleyball games, keep up with kids in the um, theaters and speech and everything like that. So just really try to make that year-round investment in them and know that you're paying attention. Uh, planning for the season two, I think as a coaching staff, our plan and focus kind of shifts from season to season depending on the types of kids and the groups of kids we have. Uh, and something that I like to do at the beginning of the season, that first week of school, is I like to interrogate our athletes, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Something that our coaching staff kind of has a tradition of uh, during the winter months is we send out holiday cards year after year after year to our athletes. Um, it just kind of gets them thinking about track in the dead of winter, gets them excited for the season, um, and they always look forward to getting those cards there. So that's kind of a, hey, track's coming up, hope to see you that first week of practice. So we'll send those out every year to our athletes. Getting back to the interrogation side of things, that first week of practice, we'll have team meetings for our boys and our girls. Uh, this is the info sheet that I give uh, my girl athletes. There's a lot of questions on there. Uh, I hang on to these and I tell them nobody's going to look at them besides uh, me and our coaching staff. But this gives us a lot of perspective on who they are as a person and who they are as an athlete. Um, so the first couple questions, you know, we're interested in what events they want to do, what they're curious in. Um, and then some of the questions down below kind of make them process, you know, what's it going to take to have a successful season or what's uh, some of their goals? How can they help the team have success? So it gets them thinking a little bit outside themselves and what they can ultimately do uh, to help the team. Something that I added recently, which I came across in a coaching article a couple of years ago, I have these empty boxes down there just letting them know if they have anything that I should be aware of. Uh, once in a while we'll have students who are involved in like AAU basketball, so they'll make a note, hey, I'm gonna miss a couple practices. Um, I had one athlete down there just lists like I struggle really bad with anxiety that you know she didn't have to tell me that um, but just knowing that kind of gives you a pre-context of how to handle and how to work with that athlete might need a little more guidance so I read these over several times I carry them with me all the time um, so that if we do end up at a meet or whatever and I see something really positive or something that you know they said they were going to do that they're doing I make sure to tell them that I noticed that and you can kind of see um, a light in their eyes. And you're gonna get all sorts of answers. Uh, these are just a couple examples here, but it's really cool to see what the kids write down. Uh, we have a lot of athletes that I think think outside of themselves and really think about the team. Uh, so it's just, again, it gives you a little context for where that athlete is going to be um, and what they're going to bring to the team. And then, as I mentioned, one of the questions we ask is, what's it going to take to have a successful season? Uh, we're a big goal-setting program, so we might have athletes that want to be all-conference or make it to state, but they got to think about what it's going to take to get there. Uh, so that question really kind of puts it on them as far as what they're going to have to do to uh, reach that. And then we ask, you know, how can they help the team as a teammate? What can we do as a coaches to help you? As you can see, we're going to get all sorts of... Um, of answers, but it's really cool to see, you know, the coaches can have fun, which spreads to us. I think us as a coaching staff joke around with the kids, they know that. Uh, so it kind of spreads, and I just think we have a really positive atmosphere because of that. And it's also cool to see, you know, their answers to how can they help the team. Uh, being a positive role model, doing my role no matter how big, that takes a lot of maturity for a high school student to say. Uh, so again, I hang on to these sheets, I acknowledge when I see them doing that. Um, so they kind of know. I don't know, I kind of wanted this to be a sharing session too. I don't know if there's other programs out there that do something similar um, or something different. I know a couple programs do a lot of posters, flyers before the end of the season with funny memes to try to get uh, students to come out. 
So I don't know if anybody does something similar, something different that they want to share right now. Can I just ask how many kids yes. you have in your program? Good question. Um, it depends on the year. Nine through 12, we probably have, I'd say, 30 boys and then 30 girls and then a few junior high um, athletes as well. So we're kind of around, I'd say, that 70 to 80 mark, depending on the year, seven through 12, boys and girls. And a few, I'd say a few of our junior high athletes, too. Um, we're very much, I think, in a baseball and softball dominant uh, school town. A lot of our junior high athletes will double up in sports. So they'll do softball and track or do baseball and track, which I think is a perfect age to do that, just because they don't necessarily get exposure to track and field um, as much in the younger age. So um, a lot of our junior high athletes will double up, and a few of them you know, will drink the track and field Kool-Aid, they'll come in, and a few of them will figure out it's not for them. But we allow them to do multiple sports that way, and the other coaches are really flexible in that. <laughs> Um, so a little bit getting into the meat and potatoes here. Um, our purpose, as I mentioned, during those first couple weeks in practices, we have team meetings. We preach our purpose. We preach what we're all about. Um, so after we get done telling them, we constantly, as coaching staff, have to show them, and we have to remind them. Uh, we meet a lot with our athletes, especially before uh, meet days. We call them pre-meet days. The boys team will meet together, the girls team will meet together, we'll go over the lineup, we'll talk about things they want to uh, focus on, what our team goals are. So that just kind of reiterates our purpose um, from week to week and meet to meet. I think our core values are summed up uh, with the three P's. So we put a big emphasis on our purpose, uh, we put a big emphasis on people and just that track and field is very much a team sport. I think a lot of coaches that maybe don't coach track and field kind of look at it as an individual um, apparatus or an individual sport, but I very much think it's a team sport. Um, and then just a little bit on the progress from the beginning of the season to the end of the season here. Uh, so when it comes to people, we really preach that we want athletes to help each other out. Um, we want them to push each other and we want them to support each other. One thing that we're constantly reminding our athletes as well is that no matter their role on the team, if they're our number one 100 runner, or they're, you know, might not make the lineup at the end of the season come conference time, they're helping the team out. You know, they're running with the distance crew or they're doing sprint workouts with our sprinters. Um, everyone adds value. I get super excited when a, you know, a girl who's maybe running the mile at 6.30 PBs and runs a 6.25, I'm just as excited about that when we have an 800 meter runner girl go from a 2.20 to a 2.17. So it's, I mean, it's being proud, it's being happy no matter what level they're at, and you got to let them know that. Another thing we tell our athletes, too, is that, you know, don't be afraid to step up. We're going to have meets where, you know, we might have a girl who's supposed to jump, let's say, you know, five feet. She ends up jumping four or six. Um, we might have a discus thrower there, Lexi, who is going to PB by 15 feet in one meet, Right. So it's really cool to highlight that and just promote that, you know, don't rely on your teammates. If you've got a big opportunity and, you know, you can step up, that's going to help the team. And we see that all the time from meet to meet to meet. And then another thing we like to do is uh, celebrate success. So one tradition that I walked into, uh, we celebrate personal best from meet to meet to meet. So after every meet day, the first thing we'll do at practice after the warm-up is we'll have our team meetings. Uh, and we'll hand out Reese's Peanut Butter Cups for any athlete that got a PB from their previous meet. That's something the that kids look forward to, and again, that celebrates everyone. It celebrates your you know, top athlete all the way down to um, your athletes as a whole. And that's something they're proud of, and it acknowledges it in front of the team, and it's just really, really good. We also keep track of top 10 marks in our program. Uh, we celebrate these as well, and I think it gives kids kind of a context of what's it, you know, going to take to be kind of competitive in our program. And another tradition I walked in that was kind of already established, any time an athlete breaks a school record, we actually give them an old record to break and snap. That's kind of our record-breaking uh, celebration that we have, and we usually do that at the end of the season uh, for our state send-off. So... Those are just kind of some of the traditions we do to celebrate and acknowledge individual success in front of the whole team. 
So purpose, one thing that we really, really preach and we always look out for um, is working with attitude and effort. Those are two things we constantly tell our athletes that they have control over. Um, so our warm-up, we're very disciplined in what that looks like, and I think it develops a mindset. As a coach, I'm watching athletes during the warm-up at practice and at meets, and I'm gauging their effort and energy level. There's been a few times where athletes have been, you know, half-assing it or, you know, just not doing it, and you have conversations to address that, and they instantly wake up and realize that. Um, and then during the workout, especially during some of our intense workouts, as a young coach, I think I strayed away from actually like sharing the purpose of what that workout was going to be. Um, I condition and train like the mid-distance runners, so the 300 hurdlers, the 400 runners, the 800 runners. We'd always develop a workout plan, and they would always come up and ask, you know, what are we doing today? And I'd just be like, you know, don't worry about it. I've changed that. I lay out the whole plan of what we're doing. You know, if we're doing repeats or if we're doing a ladder workout, I share what we're doing, how many we're doing it, and how it's going to help them. A few people, and you know, this used to be in the back of my mind, aren't you worried or aren't you concerned that the kids are going to, you know, hold off or not try as hard? A majority of our athletes do not do that. Um, they have goals. They're going to push each other. And I think it just kind of creates value in, you know, what they're actually doing. And then we add fun elements once in a while. Uh, so this is a workout we did in between uh, subsection and sections a few, year, uh, few years ago. We did a pretty intense repeat workout. Every time they uh, finished a repeat, we had a whole bunch of paint. They got to put you know, a mark on their arm or a mark on their face. So again, that just builds that team camarad or camaraderie and then it adds a little bit of fun elements. And then cool down process. We talk about what we actually accomplished. So again, it's just being open in communication, demanding your values, what you want to see in the workouts, and then ultimately sharing the purpose. Uh, another thing that I like to do is kind of work with accountability, but allow a little choice and autonomy. We have what we call pre-meet days, the day before our meets. And I kind of let our athletes choose where they're going to go and where they're going to divide their attention that day. We're going to have athletes that are doing, you know, relays, open running events, field events, and I kind of let them, you know, free range and figure it out. Um, this will put things into perspective down the road. Uh, picture there is one of my pole vaulters. If she could pole vault every single day and only pole vault, she would do it. Um, she had some talent for triple jumping, and I tried for years and years and years to steer her away. Uh, looking at our lineup last year, we kind of had a hole there, and I knew she could, you know, sneak up um, and be kind of a consistent triple jump uh, jumper for us. Those first couple meets in May, she struggled, okay, but she was not practicing it. One meet to the end of May, she jumped like 31 feet, and she's like, oh my gosh, Warren, like I jumped 31 feet. I said, imagine if you deviated a little more time over there and, you know, light bulb went off, kind of a shock. And so from there, the light bulb kind of went off. After that, she did a very nice time of balancing her time between triple jump um, and pole vault. I was hoping she would, you know, solve that or realize that by herself, and she did. Could I have stepped in early April and said, hey, you're going to triple jump today? I could have. Um, but allowing them that autonomy and kind of that self-learning process, I think, has a lot more value than kind of being a dictator and you know deviating where they should go. And then workout, something that we've done in the last few years, as I mentioned with the uh, mid-distance runners, sometimes we'll create two separate workouts that you know do the same exact things, but the kids don't know it. Um, so providing them, hey, this is option A, this is option B, what do you want to do? That gives them a little more self-control, a little more autonomy in what their workout is uh, going to be. So I think that's beneficial for athletes as well. And then one thing too with our distance crew is recovery runs. We try to make those fun and engaging once in a while. Our distance coach does a nice job of sometimes they're doing selfie runs, scavenger hunts, have to run town or run through town and take pictures of things. Again, they're getting a workout, it's kind of a hidden disguise, but it allows them just a little more team bonding time and a little bit more relaxation on kind of some of those less intense days. And with purpose comes fun. 
Once in a while, as a whole team, throwers, sprinters, distance runners, uh, we'll do some fun days. So there's a couple pictures. We'll usually do a relay day sometime in April. We did a prom relay one year where we raided our theater closet at school and they had to put on dresses and fur coats and run back and forth. Uh, we've done a pool noodle four by one relay with all our kids. Uh, so again, just adding elements of fun in there to acknowledge their hard work that they've been doing throughout the season. And one thing that we really, really stress that first week, and I bring it up week after week after week after week, is that I tell them I've never had an athlete that is going to PB from meet to meet to meet to meet to meet to meet to meet. Some of the athletes look at me and like, what are you talking about? But we really try to say that, you know, you're going to have a little up and down flow, right, in the season. And that's okay. It's really looking at, you know, so you've got a PB and high jump. That's awesome. That's great. What's the next step? Or you ran, you know, five seconds slower in the mile. That's okay. You know, what did you learn? How are you going to recover? How are you going to bounce back? So it's having those honest conversations with them uh, to really learn from the mistakes and the setbacks. Other things that we like to do is we like to prepare for the real things. It's really hard to replicate a real meet in practice. But we feel like if you put athletes in real life environments, hopefully that's going to transfer to a meet and try to invoke some real life emotions here. So one thing, uh, any meet where we're going to get, you know, seated into lanes, whether it's a conference meet or true team or anything like that, we tell our relays and our sprinters practicing block work, hey, you're in lane five tomorrow, they're practicing blocks in lane five. Our four by ones in lane two, they're practicing handoffs in lane two. That just gets them in the mindset of, okay, I'm going to be in lane two tomorrow. I'm going to be in lane five tomorrow. That's one thing to kind of evoke that real life environment that they're going to be in tomorrow. Cutting in. Uh, we work with our relays on cutting in the four by four and the four by eight. You know, I'll walk with my second four by four runner, which this year was a uh, young seventh grader. We go through different situations on that 300 start of, okay, you know, you're in third or you're in fourth or you're in fifth, uh, the fifth lane, you know, what's the, what's the route you're going to take to cut in? Same thing with our four by four um, on that handoff stretch there too. Uh, and we won't do this all the time. We'll maybe do this once a year, but we'll do relay handoffs with uh, eight teams here. So come subsection time or conference time when we get our four by one or a four by two set, we'll take everybody else put them on the track, and they're handing off a baton too. No matter if they're a you know, seasoned relay member or they have no idea what they're doing, we want to invoke that real life environment where the track is full. We encourage them, not yell and cause a circus, but you know, say hit or say pass or say things to kind of not distract our you know, four by one and four by twos that are gonna do it, but we want them in that real life environment so that they can shake off the nerves and kind of get that experience of what it's gonna be like at the conference or section meet. Like I said, we only do that like once or twice, but the kids have a blast with it. Our relays have a blast with it, and our kids who are not gonna be in our relays at the end of the season. Um, they absolutely love that, and they kind of look forward to that from year to year to year. Other things too, I like to apply field event rules uh, with my pole vaulters kind of early on in the season, and then again in May. Uh, there's lots of rules for pole vault. There's a timing situation that throws my vaulters off once in a while. So I like to do that so they know going into a meet, this is what it's going to feel like. Back in April I did it, and you know there's a time limit for how long they get on the runway. I had my vaulter run, <gasps> got scared back off, and all of a sudden I yelled like 30 seconds. And she's like, Warren, what are you doing? I said, you got time, like let's go. She's like, oh my gosh. Um, so just making sure that they're comfortable with those event rules, especially at the end of the season. Official starts, so working with our athletes on block, uh, different starters are going to have different hold times, right? So when we're practicing block work, I might switch my hold time up a little bit. I don't want them to be so um, complacent with, you know, a correct or appropriate wait time there. Um, so making sure they go through that. Location of running workouts on the track. This is a big one for me, especially with my mid-distance crew. We're going to take in the wind to consideration of where we're doing our running workout, but some of those last ones, whether we're doing ending with a 500 or ending with a 150, 
I want them to finish on that home stretch, right? That's another thing to invoke that, you know, oh my gosh, what's it going to feel like in that last 100? My legs are tired, my arms are tired. Um, so sort of get them ready in that mindset. And then speed day, when we're doing some intense workout with our mid-distance runners, we'll allow adequate uh, rest time, you know, in our plans. We got rest time allocated. But that last rep, not all the time, once in a while, I will give them limited rest time. You know, they'll get done with a 300 and they've done five of them and all of a sudden they're like, all right, back up on the line. They're like, Warren, you're killing us. But I want them on that last rep, again, to evoke that emotion of how they're going to feel that last little stretch of their 800 or that last little stretch of the 400. So providing that limited rest time, they're invoking real life, you know, race emotions and feelings. But when they get done, they have that sense of accomplishment of like, oh, that was tough. But, you know, I did it. So that's going to get them ready for that meet and that mindset for when they're, you know, feeling dog tired or their legs start to feel like jello. They've done it in practice. They're going to be able to do it in a meet then. One phrase that we have adopted and we stole this uh, from Dr. Sindra Kampoff. She's a sports psychologist at Mankato State. She came and spoke to our school about five years ago. Um, and control of controllables is something our coaches at our school wrestling, basketball, track and field have adopted with their vocabulary. Our athletes and our students know that phrase now. So it's walking through them on control of controllables. Uh, my pole vaulters are some picky kids, right? They're going to complain about standards. They're going to complain about how plush the mat, uh, mattress feels. Those are things out of their control. The weather's out of their control. The meat officials are out of their control. So I have these conversations with, theirs, at, with these athletes to kind of identify that. Again, things that are in their control that we say all the time is their attitude and effort. They know that. We don't have to tell them that. And when athletes are having off moments, especially in practice, that's an excellent learning opportunity to deal with that challenging situation. If their steps are off in the long jump approach or their steps are off in the high jump, that's, I mean, no better place in practice to get through that. And one thing that I like to do, especially with my pole vaulters, is I like to give back control. I do some strategies with my season vaulters. I don't do this with my first or second year vaulters, but I have some vaulters that I've been working with for five or six years. Uh, I like to give back control. One of my vaulters this year at the beginning of the season, you know, running with the pole, her arm was just stiff and just awkward running. And, you know, she went to go plant and the plant was just not good. Um, she super struggled with that. I know her pretty well. I've been working with her for five years. She's like, Warren, my arm. And we named her arm Rigid Regina, right? And she's like, oh my gosh, don't call it that. But I think naming something takes its power away. That might sound really, really stupid. But after we started, you know, calling her arm Rigid Regina, pretty soon it went off in her light bulb. Like, gosh, that's stupid. Like, I can correct that. A couple weeks later, um, it was gone. Once in a while, they'll complain about standards. Like, oh my gosh, Warren, did you see that standard? You know, and I'll just get back control um, that way. So taking that pressure off with the athletes, naming certain things. Another one of my vaulters, she claimed she had a phantom step, an extra step um, in her approach. No extra step, but she felt like it. One meet, she was almost in tears. And again, I've known her for uh, quite a few years. She's like, Warren, my phantom leg is back. I said, great, you let me know what time the phantom leg is going to come back. 3.45, 3.40. She kind of looked at me like, what are you talking about? I said, give me a time, I wanna see it, you know. Sure enough, light bulb went off in her head, she did it, she's like, oh my God, it's gone. I was like, well, it was never there, but yay, you know, <laughs> we're over it. Um, so having some of that giving back control where you're gonna, I don't wanna say poke fun at them, but I think naming certain things or kind of doing that element of surprise, like, okay, what time, you know, what time are you gonna do this phantom like? It gives back control and kind of gets rid of that issue that they're having. Another thing that we really, really like to do is we're a big goal-setting program. I put a lot of emphasis on performance-based goals. I think a lot of our athletes get fixated on a time or a height or a distance, and that's all they think about. So the first couple times we set goals, not that I'm not concerned about what their time and their distance or height is, but I want them to set performance-based goals that are going to help them to get there. So you want to run a sub 3200 or you want to high jump five feet. That's great. What are some performance-based goals that you can do? 
maybe it's a you know clean block work um, maybe it's you know I don't know my pole vaulters maybe it's getting speed down the runway or working on inversion those are performance based things that they can do that is hopefully going to get them to their goal distance um, time or height so really really putting an emphasis on the performance based things that they have control over and another thing we like to do is process their performance and goals I tell all my girls I want them to come and see me at every meet as a pole vault coach at a meet it's really hard for me to be in multiple areas at once and they do a really really nice job of coming to find me you know I can kind of see depending on the meet uh, what's going on in the track and some of the other field events or whatever but we really like to process their performance that day and celebrate those small wins or address the setbacks that they might encounter one thing too that I think is really important uh, this is something I tell my athletes too if they're a state champion in the 400 meter run or they're you know not gonna make our lineup at the end of the season in whatever event maybe they're gonna be an alternate I think it's really really important to have them compete with themselves and really say okay here's what I'm capable of today this is what the event is going to demand I think sometimes you might have a star athlete who goes into a meet where there might not be a lot of competition they might say to themselves you know this is going to be easy I think a majority of the time they underperform same thing with an athlete that might be scared at a big meet like oh my gosh I'm not as fast as these kids and if they're gonna say this is going to be hard I think they're also going to underperform so it's kind of shoving out the competition removing that from your mindset and really just focusing on yourself what you can do that day and I think nine times out of ten they're rising to that occasion and they're gonna PB or perform where they should be so I think that's something to be cautious of like I said with our star athletes um, and with our athletes who might not be an all-state athlete at the end of the season trust the process is another term that we like to throw at our athletes and they kind of throw it back at us in mockery but um, this whole idea of trusting the season right we always tell our athletes if you're gonna work hard if you're gonna have a good attitude and you're gonna put effort the process that we have planned for you we promise that you're gonna finish better at that season from when you started and I think a lot of times in practice, whether it's a fuel event or a running workout or a speed workout, um, we want our athletes to develop confidence from doing the workout, not out of fear, if that makes sense. So again, we're knowledgeable of where our competition and where our schools are at where, uh, that we're gonna compete with, but we want them to develop confidence in practice to better themselves and not necessarily focused on what's going on with other athletes at other schools. We put a big emphasis too on competing to win versus competing not to lose. I think this uh, happens in team sports like basketball, volleyball, but also individual sports where once in a while you'll have an athlete go in and they're just, you know, they're trying not to lose, they're trying to hold on. I think when you have athletes switch that gear and really compete to win, shove the competition outside of their mind, they're gonna rise to occasion. And then work with a want uh, to get better. I think at practice when they're doing that tough running workout or they're mastering a new technique at a fuel event um, that's going to develop a want and a confidence moving into the meet where they're going to walk around with a little more swagger and a little more confidence uh, trusting the process we talked a little bit about it's really hard for an athlete to PB 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 and just constantly getting a mark something that I struggle with uh, with our pole vaulters and with our high jumpers, right? They're only gonna get so high. I tell my pole vaulters all the time. It's not humanly possible to go from nine feet to 10 feet to 12 feet. To, at some point, right, you're gonna reach your max or your ceiling, okay? So I really try to work with my vaulters on raising the floor. And what I mean by that is, you know, they might jump nine, six at a mid-April meet. The next meet, they might jump only nine feet or eight, six. They think the world's gonna end. But if they're consistently in that wheelhouse of eight, six, nine, nine, six, nine, and all of a sudden, you know, their averages start going up, that's a good thing. So we really try to stress with these two events that, you know, don't judge your next performance based on your season best, okay? Let's take a look at the last three meets. Let's take a look at the last five meets. Are you consistently around that five foot mark? Yes, you might have jumped 410 last week. The world's not gonna end, okay? We'll be ending if you jump three, six last week. Okay, then we can have this conversation 
Um, so it's really having that conversation that let's take a look at the average of the last five and not compare ourselves all the time to that season best that hopefully they're going to reach down the road. And then having tough conversations. This is something I struggled with as a young coach. Working with my vaulters or even some of my runners, I'm always quick to congratulate or acknowledge what I've seen versus corrections. Um, and you gotta teach a tolerance for kind of some in-moment mishaps, especially with the vault. They might have a really funky approach. Um, their inversion was super bad, okay? Teach them how to accept that and how to shake it off. I always ask my vaulters too, hey, can I give you some feedback? I'm never gonna, you know, undump what they're all doing wrong unless they're uh, ready for it. Something I'll do with my vaulters too is I'll film them. I'll upload all the film onto a Google Drive. They have access to it and they can watch how many videos we're filming at practice there. That gives them a learning moment too where they can go back and analyze. They'll come back to practice and be like, oh my God, Warren, I'm doing this wrong. Yep, you are. Like, I'm glad you saw. So really, really process them uh, with them. And something I like to do at meets too is I like to ask processing questions and lead them to what they can correct. So my vaulter gets done. Her arms might have been super, super bad on the plant. She'll get done. She'll be like, Warren, something fell off. I'm like, yep, yeah, you don't have any idea. But I think it was my arms. Yep, you're right. You know, we got to correct those. So again, it's giving back control and it's kind of steering them in a way to help them draw a conclusion on what's going on versus me not necessarily yelling at them, but coming up to me and saying, you got to fix your arms. So again, puts it a little bit on them to kind of draw a conclusion while you're steering them through that process. Also with tough conversations, word choice matters. Uh, something that I'm very careful with with our relay teams is I will say at the end of the season, it's the best for fit. I do not say the four fastest. Uh, reason being, we might have an athlete, and we did have an athlete this year who was probably a top four, one, two, and 400 runner. However, she was giving us points in other events. So I steer away from the four fastest, okay? Once in a while, we might have a fast girl who might be our third or fourth 800 runner. Might be really inconsistent from me to me. So what are you gonna go with? Kind of what you know or kind of inconsistency? So I really watch my word choice with my relays. And with our relays, especially with our girls, I tell them, uh, during the month of April, our relays are gonna be very, very fluid. Okay, we're gonna put girls in, in and out, in and out, you're gonna do some opening events. And then once we get towards the month of May, we're gonna start to kind of solidify on what our end of the season relays look like. Um, I think too, you gotta acknowledge tears and frustration. Uh, athletes like to be really hard on themselves. You gotta provide them a space to be vulnerable, be crying. Um, be frustrated, but have those tough conversations with them on what they can learn from their frustration and kind of their setback. Something too is we really put an emphasis. Um, yes, we want our athletes to be outcome aware, okay? That kind of end goal, their end time, their end height, but we really want them to be focused on the purpose and process it takes. Going back to work choice matters, this is one of my first four by eight relays that I had to deal with. Uh, we were at this section meet, and I made one of the most stupidest mistakes as a young coach can make. Had a chance at going to state. We're super, super nervous. Uh, really, you know, high performer, 4.0 students, and they come up to me, and they're like, Mr. Warren, oh my gosh, we're so nervous. And I thought I was going to be young and hip. I was like, I'm so nervous for you, too. <laughs> um, they immediately ran to one of our assistant coaches, and they're like, Warren said he's nervous for us. And it's not, not a wise choice. Um, they ended up getting third that day, they ran a PB, they did what they had to do, they didn't make it to state. That next year, um, we had another 4 by 8 they eventually made it to state. That year we probably had six girls that could have probably been a part of the team. I did a lot of sneaky things with them. Uh, one meet, it was unlimited, uh, we entered two 4 by 8s in, we put our two fastest girls against each other, our third and fourth against each other, our fifth and sixth, and our seventh and eighth as a workout. I wasn't doing that to be mean. Uh, one of my seniors called me out on it. Amaya knew what I was doing. She came up to me before the end of the meet. She's like, I know what you're doing. I said, do you? She said, yep. She's like, she was frustrated with it, but I said, don't, don't worry about it, right? Um, she was another one that was very extremely nervous about her spot, if she was gonna hold it. 
We were at the section true team meet her senior year and she was just sobbing on the infield. Um, at that time, I knew she was gonna be a part of it. She did not know. I had that honest conversation with her that I needed her in that four by eight, even though she was on you know, that third or fourth or fifth fastest runner, depending on the meet. That gave her just a little sense of calming and I'll talk about um, trusting your athletes here. Um, one thing I like to do with my athletes, I don't hear what's being said all the time, right? So I really try to solicit feedback, not that I need to know what all the drama and she said and you know what she said, but how are the workouts going, right? Is practice set up in a way that's allowing us to get what we need to get done? And athletes are really honest with me and I appreciate that. Um, another thing you can do, I think, is develop plans and thinking of the future. Two of our athletes here, uh, I'm not afraid to put younger athletes on the leads of some of our relays. Uh, some coaches might not necessarily agree with that, but I, for me, I think I'm thinking about their future, okay? Develop them into a leader down the road, especially if they're super talented and what they can kind of offer in that road. Uh, Brooklyn here was just a seventh grader leading the four by eight at the state, and then Katero was just an eighth grader leading the four by one at state. Something that I did with them is I helped to develop an individual plan for them. Not based on other runners, but what they could do. Running to me, especially distance running, you can't plan a script, right? It's kind of improv. It's based off what the other runners are doing, and you you know, it's very soul-focused mindset. Brooklyn was a people pleaser. I knew that, okay? Before the section meet, she comes up, or I, she, I go up to her and I said, do you want to plan for tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, I want to plan. So, uh, me and her talked about a plan that was solely dependent upon what she could do. Not about what the other teams were doing or what that other first runner split was in the last meet, but what she could do. She accepted the plan, she was super excited. Uh, that day, you know, she's eating breakfast at home, and this is a story from her mom, but you know, she's like, are you ready for today, Brooklyn? And she's like, yep, Lauren gave me a plan. Two of her sisters were on the relay, and she didn't even tell her sisters the plan, okay? And that's how seriously she took it. She executed the plan phenomenally, and now as a junior, um, this upcoming year, she's now a leader, she's confident. So once again, thinking about that future. Katera here, I threw her in as a lead for the 4x8, one of the best athletes that I've worked with coming out of the blocks. Um, I have a little bit of a close connection or a soft spot for her. Excellent student, excellent worker. Um, 2019 season, she was on the state 4x8, or excuse me, state 4x1. 2020, we didn't have a season. Um, 2020, COVID pandemic was super hard on her. Didn't have the season she wanted, 2021. Last year as a junior, uh, we were pretty fortunate to have a big crew of talented 100 runners. She probably could have been on our 4x1 relay in any given year, but because we had five girls that could run a 13.6 or faster, she was that alternate. Um, she came in my classroom one day in April, and she just kind of said, hey, Warren, do you ever think I'm going to run the 4x1 ever again? And we had started looking at True Team um, and starting to figure out and configuring our lineup. I decided to be really honest with her. I trusted her. Um, we were going to pull one of our 4x1 athletes out of the 4x1 relay to do the open one and the open two because we needed some points in there. And I told her, I said, I got a big opportunity, big plan for you. She kind of smiled. She goes, what is it? I said, here's our plan going into true team. I said, I got to take Maddie out of the 4x1. I said, you're seasoned in that 4x1. I want you in there. Um, Maddie was running the curve for us or the third leg, so she's like, do I got to run the third leg? I said, nope, you're going back to your staple. I said, you're going to start for us. Her eyes lit up. She did a fantastic job. Um, the week before True Team, Block worked constantly with a baton in her hand. She owned that opportunity. Um, so again, it's thinking about that future. It's trusting your athletes, coming up with a plan for them to really shine not only that season, um, but down the road. Some of the activities, too, that we do to help put things in perspective, I mentioned we talk a lot about goal writing. We'll actually have them write their goals down. A lot of our athletes will have them up in their locker, um, at home on their mirror, so they can see them every day. One activity that I like to do, not every year, because uh, I think it takes its power away, right before the section meet, right, athletes, kids are super nervous about what could happen. 
I think it's important to acknowledge fears. So we'll have athletes write down what their fears are, right? Maybe it's dropping a baton, or maybe it's you know not making opening height, or something that they're probably not gonna do. Putting on a paper allows them to get it off their brain, address it, right? Acknowledge it because it's real. Then I'll bring out a trash can, they'll crumple it up, throw it in the trash, out of their mind. That's what I tell them, right? We acknowledged it, we wrote it down, now we're not gonna think about it. Some of our athletes that might be a little nervous on meet day, I'll do grounding with them. Some of my vaulters get super, super anxious, super, super nervous, okay? I'll realize that, I'll start to do grounding activities with them. Name five people you can see. Uh, you know, it just takes their mind off of it. What does the ground feel like? Um, it just gives them a little bit of sense of calming here. A paper clip or a safety pin if they're wearing bibs or whatever, if I got a pole vaulter that's super, super nervous about something or like, oh my God, my plant is so bad. I'll give them the paper clip, right? As long as the paper clip's in their hand, they can think about all the bad things they've done. Oh my gosh, my plant is bad. I got to fix it. I got to fix it. My arm is wanky. Paper clip in hand, all the negative thoughts, right? Toss it on the ground, negative thoughts no more. That works for some athletes, not all athletes. And we really try to have that conversation with our, or with our athletes that if you're gonna be in a pressure-filled moment or you're extremely nervous, that's opportunity. Uh, that's really hard for, I think, high school athletes to recognize as opportunity, but a lot of our athletes have kind of switched that gear from recognizing, yes, I might be nervous at the section meet or the conference meet, but what a cool opportunity for me to compete and see what could potentially happen. So it's really, I mean, just working with some athletes, especially on an individual one-on-one -on -one basis to try to figure out how they click, what's gonna work for them, um, and what's not gonna work for them. Um, we got about 13 minutes left. That's all I have for you. I don't know if you have any questions on some of the activities we did or if there's certain things that you do with your athletes to kind of get them ready for the big meets, calm their nerves. Yes? You mentioned earlier that you give kids workout options where you think A or B, they, they come to the same thing. Yep. Um, right away, I think, depending on the numbers that you're working with for that pool, yeah. if you've got half the kids doing this workout, half the kids doing the other workout, and you're in a position as a coach where you got to try and manage both two instead of one workout with all the kids, now you have two different workouts. Yes. That manage. So do you intentionally choose workouts that you can kind of Manage both at the same time, or do you have the coaching staff that can handle that? So mid-distance, uh, myself and Holly um, work with them. So when we plan two different workouts, right, we're kind of strategic on which ones we're offering. Option A might be a pacing workout where, um, you know, our 800 runners, we got a goal pace for them. We're doing a whistle workout with cones that might be, you know, two or 300 meter repeats where they're understanding what that threshold feels like. Option B might be a ladder workout where we're starting with, you know, 150 flies going up to 250s, 350s, and then our way down. So we structure it where we can maintain and watch and sub rest time with each group. That's how we've been kind of able to figure out and manage that with kind of a small and coaching staff. Any other questions? We had records and files from meets um, on the internet in Google Drive for probably the last 10 or 12 years. I sat in our uh, public library. They have newspapers going back to the 70s. I think I probably spent a total of about 12 hours there. Not in one day, but I would go a couple days of the week. So I tell my kids our top 10 records are probably 95% accurate, right? Um, being that we went off of newspaper articles from like 2000 all the way back to the 70s, there might have been some times and distances and heights we met, or excuse me, missed, um, but it took a lot of research. <laughs> and like I said, they're probably about 95% accurate just because we didn't have all those online databases from that time. Yes? Um, you're scheduled for the day. Yep. I know you mentioned a lot of times you 
like your pre-read days or in your regular days, do you do a meeting before you before you start practice, after? How do you do that? I've, I've done it multiple different ways. Yeah. And just think about how do you do that when you're approaching that first on regular and on pre-read days? Yeah, so the first thing, they're always going to do a warm-up. And then if we're doing, let's say it's pre-meet day, right? we got to meet tomorrow. Uh, we're meeting with the boys' team and the girls' team separately, going over the lineup, and then you know giving them kind of a plan of attack for what that day is going to look like for pre-meet. On our non-pre-meet days, whether we're doing speed work with our runners or we're doing a field event day, uh, we're having a very, very short meeting after workout just explaining, hey, it's a field event day, you know, Try to get to here and here and here. If it's a speed day, we're, you know, throwers are going to go throw. The sprinters are got an intense sprinting workout. Distance has got a workout planned. And then mid-distance got a workout planned. So our meetings are base touching with uh, the athletes on non-pre-meet days. Very, very small as far as, like, meeting length goes. But you do it after the warm-up. Yes. Yep. So you always do the warm-up first to kind of get them in the flow and then... Yep, get them in the mindset, get them in the flow, and yep, yep. Yeah. How do you maintain good communication with your assistant coaches throughout the season to ideas in regard to that? Also, like, making the lineup for given needs. Yes, uh, we're pretty fortunate. We've had our coaching staff together now, I think, for, like, six years. We haven't had any, like, changeover, brought in somebody new. Uh, so we kind of know how each other um, operates. As far as the meet lineup goes, I rely on my assistant coaches to kind of give me some feedback. Um, so I'm asking my throwers coach, you know, who should throw um, in the meet later this week. I'm asking my distance coach what she wants to do, um, you know, with the 8, the 16, uh, the 32, the 4 by 8. I'm working with my long jump, triple jump, high jump coach. So they're giving me feedback on what that lineup um, should be. As I mentioned, I mean, being in two separate school buildings, we, we have to communicate. Um, it's super exhausting some days. Uh, you know, it starts raining at one o'clock and I'm trying to uh, teach my ninth graders in the wood shop and I'm trying not to have them cut off any limbs with a saw. Um, it's downpouring, I got the AD coming down to my room, I'm trying to text with my coaching staff. Um, so it's just really being proactive and being an excellent communicator all the time. And we have to do that super hard because we're two separate schools. Any other questions? There was an announcement I was supposed to make at the start and because I didn't, they threatened me to fire me. <laughs> <laughs> Can't fire a volunteer. Uh, uh, do not rely on the paper schedule that you've got. I am told that you received an email last night. Okay. Uh, I've never seen so many changes. I've never seen so many speakers back out for one reason or another than I've seen this year. So it's, Johnny's doing a heck of a job trying to fill slots, but uh, so announcement's been made. <laughs> you still get it, yeah. Yep, you have a question? Yeah, so the, the unfortunate thing for us, and you're probably in that same boat too, is our practice time gets shortened because of that bus ride. So, I mean, we're kind of at a disadvantage, I would say, compared to other programs because now we got to scrunch what we want to, you know, cutting off 15 minutes at the end of each practice uh, time. So, I guess the answer to your question, our kids, uh, our student athletes from Eden Valley Watkins really use that bus time as a socialization time which is awesome, right? They're building bonds. They're kind of getting in that mindset. It's nice to touch base with my coaches on the bus too. They're at the elementary school, I'm at the high school. So we kind of talk about what our plan for the week is. So we try to use that time as a planning time for us. Um, but yeah, it is unfortunate because we get 15 minutes dinged at the beginning and then we get 15 minutes dinged at the end. Uh, for our Kimball student athletes, they get out of school at three, 304 and we the EVW students don't get over there until about 325 so again they got kind of a leg time too but that allows them time to chill on the field get a suntan get their mindset ready um, 
it's just unfortunate. We can't extend practice because the other practices end at that time. We got an activity bus that goes out in our community and drops kids off. So, yeah, it's hard because we don't have the time like other programs do. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. I got a uh, question, kind of a little bit out of what you're thinking, but can you maybe explain to me how do you how do you put together captains? You know, with this kind of team, how do you put together captains? Yes. Um, I, as a girls coach, actually have not had captains designated captains in the last three years. Um, I get. I guess there's no rhyme or reason behind that, but. I rely on some of my seniors and juniors and upperclassmen just to be, I mean, natural leaders. I haven't given them the title of captain. I treat them like a captain. I don't announce who my captains are, which is kind of a faux pas. Uh, but I think it takes away, I don't want to say that title, but it just allows them to do what they're supposed to do without being designated a captain. Like I said, I'll rely on my seniors, I'll go to them, you know, ask them questions, solicit feedback, and I expect them to lead by example when we're at meets and at practice. That's just a given that I tell them at the end or at the beginning of the season. Anybody else? Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good, good. It's good to be here.